I would actually like to ask a question myself, directed to Sheikh Ala, while we wait for the brothers and sisters to send in questions. Where does a teenager begin? They want to become a leader in their community. I remember when I first met Sheikh Shadi as a 14 year old, I remember exactly how he dealt with me. He made me feel empowered, he made me feel special, he made me feel like I had something to offer. For all the teenagers, for all the youth that are sitting there today, where does their journey begin? MashaAllah, great question. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala The journey begins with looking within to truly find out who you are. But you have to have a beginning. It has a map, a road map in the end. So you have to have a goal. But you also have to know how the consequences of the end will have a, upon your beginning in order for you to understand the, the best thing and the importance of your beginning. So you have to have a righteous company and the righteous environment. These are the top two that I always ask the youth to hang around with. And you will find the righteous group in the righteous environment, like the masajid, the centers, the UMA. And that's why, wallahi, I was so impressed when I came here and I said about Sheikh Shadi Sulaiman, Habibullah. You know, in a few years when he, uh, he took me back and saw me, showed me the, 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 the area for the UMA, and when I came back, as I said in the gala dinner, I was so impressed. I, I see the youth. They're playing, they're having fun. That's how they're raised. Now I'll tell you what, the reason I say this is because the, the, the golden arches, I, again, I don't do politics, please understand. How, how, you know how they get it? They get you because by, they get your children. Earlier on, they give them the beautiful uh, fun pack and the, game and, and the games and all the gifts and all that stuff. They hook them when they're beginning. And that's why I tell you, the centers are vital to our futures because if you keep your children right here having fun, so I'm asking the, 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 the youth to start in the masajid, in the centers. I'm also asking the centers to make it fun for them. With all due respect to the uncle's theory, please, we need the uncles, we need the wisdom, we need the experience, but we also need the youth to delegate that to them. So look for a center that welcomes you. That's how you start. Look for people like Sheikh Shadi, look for people like the guys that know exactly how to bring in it to have fun. Have fun and games. So you'll get to know them and bond with them and grow with them. And that's how Usama ibn Zaid, 18 years old, was in charge of an army that had Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar, the best of the future. That's how to start, Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khairan. Powerful, powerful answer. Inshallah, the, the next question for Yusuf Chambers, inshallah. One of the attendees asks, how can they balance their interactions with non-Muslims for the sake of da'wah, but also trying to stick to an Islamic environment to ensure that your deen is protected? So how do you strike that balance? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam, rasulullah. Of course, it's a very amazing question. Ajib, alhamdulillah, very important. It's called UMA. That's it. Takbir. Because <laughs> you got the center, you invite them to the coffee shop, have some nice, beautiful food. I think the pizzas are going to go down a, a treat. And some of the beautiful food and the hospitality, the smiles, and you're in your own environment, you're in your comfort zone, and there's not much else to answer apart from that. Now, in other cities, you will be concerned about it, not in Sydney. <laughs> Sydney is a done deal. UMA. Jazakallah khairan. A question for Brother Shah, inshallah. What is the best form of dawah for a sister in a majority non-Muslim workplace? Alhamdulillah. This question should be addressed to the sisters to answer. Yes. Okay, uh, never mind. See, uh, for the sisters to do dawah to non-Muslims, what I will say is this, uh, raise the children. And when you raise the children, the generation to come that we are raising now, they have a lot of Christians. Agree with me? And the new generation, the new children now, they do not follow anything blindly. They have questions upon questions, and they would, they would normally say, don't force me to do anything. If you want me to do something, convince me first. So we need to know how to address current issues. What are the questions that people have against Islam? 
will our children to address this, inshallah. And also, among the misconceptions against Islam is women-related issues. A lot of non-Muslims have this idea, Islam oppress women. Brothers and sisters, let me give you an example. Is it okay? Is Islam just between men and women? Yes or no? Yes? Then why is there polygamy in Islam? Why these brothers can marry four? If really Islam is just, then just as the brothers can marry four wives, then the sisters should be also allowed to marry four husbands. When you pray, where do the brothers pray? In front. Where do the sisters pray? At the back. Inheritance, the brothers get double compared to the women. And in the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 34, it says, the husband can beat the wife. Isn't it so? Sorry, uh, did I actually answer your question or put more doubts in your mind? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are living in a world, we need to actually master how to answer this simple question, how to address, and I agree with you, Islam is just, when you know the answers, not only Islam is just, Islam is so beautiful. But anyway, I will use this to promote also, during the Easter period, Easter holidays, UMA is going to organize a Dawah workshop. If you can make it, please come. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Thank you. Inshallah, for that. Inshallah I'm going to open this up because of the, the pertinence of this question. But what advice would you give to the sisters or brothers who are facing Islamophobia, um, whether it's in the workplace, in their public daily life, catching a train, catching transport? What advice would you give? I would like to open this up. Anyone, anyone in Okay. So, as I said before, uh, uh, ignorance is number one enemy, correct? Yeah, people fear what they don't know. And once you invite them over for home and eat your, you know, your, your uh, don't eat them, no, no, don't eat your guests, no. Share your food, that's what I meant, share your food with them. The, as a Sunnah, by the way, Prophet Muhammad used to invite people others, right? So when I talked, when I said here, help them right how to invite them take the barriers down because they see you totally different but when they see you as a human being it's very difficult for them to say you know what they're different they're not yes so the islamophobia as we mentioned is like the dr pavlov theory i, I alluded to it and i'm going to explain it quickly inshallah so dr pavlov theory is a simple he had a dog he gave the dog the food as soon as he, he did that he rang the bell so the dog associated the food with the bell right so after a while, he didn't give him the food, he just rang the bell, the, the, the dog salivated because that's the associated. So how, how many times have you heard this? A Muslim terrorist, the Islamic jihadist, the Muslim fundamentalist, everything Islam, Islamic or Muslim has a negative connotation in the end. That's normal, right? Like, with all due respect, to Allah, with, you know, the, the gentleman, may, may God help us all, that did what he did, he had the manifesto and he was quoting the Bible. Not, they did, I mean, we were just hoping that they would be called terrorists, right? We were hoping that they would label him as a terrorist. But not one single person called a Christian terrorist. But for us, no problems. I teach the, the, the army, the Canadian army. I teach the Canadian police. I sit on the advisory board. But not one single person would ever tell you that. That even the IRA, they're Christians killing Christians, but they will never tell them a Christian or their terrorist organization. They will not associate a religion with that because that is the right. Because terrorism has no religion. It's blind. It has no color, no creed, no gender bias. But that's the unfortunate part. With one, every other day here in Australia, there was a negative connotation front page about Muslims. Every other day. You understand? So my goal to take advantage of the situation is the one million person march to the Parliament Hill. I want to make sure that we have the same rights. So Islamophobia has to be illegal, just like anti-Semitism. That's your goal. If you don't take advantage of this, nothing will change. If people are not held accountable of what they say about us, to give others, and that's the trick. The trick is they dehumanize you and demonize you. You become a number. How many people died? 11 people died last night.
41, five people have died last night. You become a number, you're not a human being, but if somebody else does from the other side, they will show you the dying, you know, the, the dying son, the orphan this, and the children are cry crying because their father died, and now a widow is there, and the mother lost her son, becomes a human, but we are not human apparently. That's how they dehumanize you first. And then they demonize you, then it becomes an easy number. It's like a target game, man. So how do you do that? But that's what I was talking about. Be relevant. Leave something behind. Invite people. Live with a smile. Brothers think it's a smile to a sister or whatever it is. Or it's, it's like a, it's a aura, right? Your teeth are aura, right? <laughs> I'm going to show kiss because I can't smile. Yeah, I'm me smiling is sadaqa wallahi. But these are kafir. Yeah, I'm me, they're human beings, wallahi. Didn't Prophet Muhammad sallam, stand up to a Jewish man that died? He says, isn't it a soul? Can we not live Islam, brothers and sisters? That's the best way for da'wah, and that's the way to eradicate Islamophobia. Just be a Muslim. Live Islam. That's how you can get rid of it. Allah. Anyone else want to add on that, inshallah? I don't know how I can uh, really make better of that, but <laughs> uh, alhamdulillah, look, um, what they've done is systematically over 60, 70, 80 years demonize Muslims in the media. And they've done that in Hollywood, they're doing it in Bollywood, <laughs> they're doing it in Lollywood, and <laughs> probably, every, every wood. I don't know, every wood that you can possibly see, even the forests are probably <laughs> demonizing the Muslims. But, you know, the thing is, where are the Muslims in that space? Where are they? There aren't any. Well, there are. But guess what? You know, we should have been doing this 20, 30 years. It's our fault. You know, when you keep blaming other people, three fingers pointing back at you, one forward. You know, bottom line is that we need to create storytelling, visual storytelling, and proliferate it everywhere in the media. I want you to do a little exercise tonight when you go home or, you know, don't get your phones out now. I want you to go and shake Google, go and consult the sheikh and uh, ask him, Muslims, put the term Muslims in, put, put the term Islam in, put the term Quran, put the term Muhammad in. Those four terms, yeah? See who owns the shop window for the best products of mankind. Who do you think owns them? Who's talking about them? Who are we blaming? <laughs> Blame yourself, you know? Because at the end of the day, if you're not prepared to take ownership of the best product, the best shop windows, and you want to lease out those shop windows to other people who hate you, <laughs> Islamophobia is rife. It's going to happen. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. So we need to own at least... Half of the search criteria I've mentioned, we need to have at least two or three websites that are totally brilliant, they're optimized, and they're answering the questions. Who are Muslims? What do we stand for? You know, what have we got to offer? We've got a lot to offer. It, it, it's an amazing thing. The other thing is, we all, Individually, Sheikh Ala was mentioning this about leadership. We all need to take ownership of our own little area. It's called our house. And the Prophet Wasallam used to start, said, start with yourself, then your family, your loved ones. And then you start looking at your neighbors. You remember I mentioned in the speech about 40 neighbors, this side and this side. Has anyone thought about dealing with those people? Can you imagine how many people in the room, two, 300 people or whatever, if there's a thousand, and then you multiply that by 40. Imagine every single household took care of 40 houses there and there. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Become a social activist. Clean up your area. Invite people. Open your, your, fr your fr front room for all the neighbors to do like a neighborhood watch. This is what we do in some of the masajid we work with in, in, in England. We allow the neighbors to use our centers to make sure that they're safer environments. Then, guess what? This is a story, and this is a true story. This is a, a guy took it on himself 
after visiting one of the massages we were working with in Plymouth called Piety. It's called Piety. Plymouth Islamic Education Trust with a Y. And anyway, the guy said he was going to blow some people up. And apparently he was a Muslim. Allah knows best. We don't know because we never met him really. And he visited Piety once. And then he put this fizzling bag in, in a place called the Giraffe Restaurant. Nobody was hurt apart from himself. Alhamdulillah. Thank God for that. And then they came to Piety. They knocked on the door. And they said, we're going to have to close the place. And we're going to do a major investigation on this place. Uh, so probably for about a week, you will not be able to use the place. So the brothers, they were clued up. First day, lots and lots of curries, lots and lots of coffees, lots and lots of hosp hosp really amaz amazing hospitality. Okay? And it was great. It was going well. The media turn up. The poets. The modern day poets. Rasulullah Sassam had them. We've got them. They turned up. Neighbor number one. Knock on the door. Do you know that you've got a lot of terrorists? You know, fundamentalists uh, next door? Sorry? You mean Muhammad? Oh, Muhammad? Do you know that he was the first person to visit my sick mother? And not even my family members came before him? He's a great guy. Uh-oh. The poet's got nothing to say anymore. Next door, similar thing happens. Next door, similar thing happens. Next door, the guy's saying, oh, that's our neighborhood watch center. Can you leave it alone? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? If we are engaged in this community and we really, really care about this community, we really, like none of you truly believe until you love for others like you love for yourself, like Rasulullah Sassam said. And that does not, that means insan. That means, you know, according to the scholars, that means insan. That's not just akhi. If we really care for them and we really show we care and that's part of our faith, Guess what? No one can say anything. Allah knows best. Jazakallah khairan for that. A uh, question for Brother Shah, inshallah. This is um, a pertinent topic as well. A non-Muslim believes that the purpose of life is to be a good person and that, you know, uh, that, that's the entire essence of the purpose of life. How do we convince them that Islam is the right path? and only the right path. And, you, and, and Brother Yusuf, of course, inshallah, if you wanted to add. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I was a non-Muslim before. Of course, people tell you the purpose of life is to be good, etc., etc. But then how do you measure what is good, what is not good? What is good, what is evil must be objective. It cannot be subjective. Now, what is good for some people, for some other community, for some other people, they say that is evil. Now, for a Muslim, how I would do a da'wah to a non-Muslim, what is the purpose of life, and so on. First of all, I would ask them this question, do you believe God exists? Today, there are many people who are atheists and agnostics. Do you know the difference between atheists and agnostics? Not sure? Okay, the first difference is the spelling. Yeah, it's true. But, but that's not the answer you're looking for. Okay. <laughs> Okay, an agnostic, he's not sure whether God exists or not. Maybe there is God, maybe there is not God. That's an agnostic. Maybe there's a superpower. And atheists, do they believe or not? Atheists believe. They believe God does not exist. So to an atheist, there is no God. So if this person is an agnostic or atheist, first I would establish whether God exists. Now what is the common denomination? between us and them. For the atheists or agnostic, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in religion, what is their holy scripture? Most of them generally would be science and logic. So I will discuss with them about evolution theory, general theory of relativity by Einstein, special theory of relativity, a study of photons of electromagnetic radiation, intelligent design, etc., to establish the existence of God. Once we agree God exists, then who is God? Now in each religion, what is the concept of God? Can I give you some examples here? 
We discussed about Islam just now, right? From the Quran, Suratul Ikhlas, chapter 112, verse 1 to 4. We have discussed that. Now, for the Christian, I will ask them, when I read your Bible, I find your Bible to be very interesting. Now, when I say the Bible is interesting to a Christian, how do they feel? Do they feel good or bad? Would they say, no, you are wrong? They don't do that. And they will ask you, why? Because when I read your Bible, I'm amazed, I'm so surprised that I find so many similarities between the Bible and the Quran. And they will ask you, what do you mean? For an example, what is the most important commandment in Christianity? The answer is given in Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse number 29. When a man approached Jesus, and he asked Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus replied, Shama Israelu, Adonai Ilahai no Adonai Ihad. Jesus did not speak English. He spoke Hebrew, Aramite. What does it mean? Hear all Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Similar message is also given in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse number 4, by Moses. Peace be upon him. Shama Israelu, Adonai Ilahai no Adna Ihad. Here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Now again, in the Quran says, Huwawahu ahad. Jesus says, Adonai ihad. Moses says, Atna ihad. Ahad, ihad, ihad. Arabic language, Aramaic language, Hebrew language, meaning God is one. I mean, I will go one after one after one after one. If I meet the Hindu, for example, to do da'wah to the Hindu, Please do not use the Bible. They have their own scriptures. Many. The most authentic scripture for the Hindu would be the Vedas. There are four Vedas. Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda, Atharva Veda. They've got the Upanishad, the Puranas, Mavrata, Ramayana, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad, Bhagavatam, Tirukural, Tirumural, many scriptures. But let's look into Chandokya Upanishad, Kanto number 6, Shloka number two, mantra number one. Ekam evitiyam. That's in Sanskrit. It means God is one without a second. Very similar to kul huwawahu ahad. What does ahad mean? One without a second. And that is how you go one by one and you start doing da'wah. The similarities and they will find there are similarities in their scriptures and Islam but we practice we worship God the way the scripture says. That's how we invite them, insha'Allah. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Insha'Allah. We'll take one last question, insha'Allah. And I think this is a suitable question to wrap up on. A question for Sheikh Ala, insha'Allah. After we've spent, I guess, the whole day at this conference, how do you know the difference between beneficial knowledge and non-beneficial knowledge? Good question. See, the, the scholars will tell you that the beneficial knowledge, that there is something that whether you ask about, you will know whether it's an ignorance that does not harm or knowledge that will not benefit. You have to know the difference. And it's based upon a question. That's why the scholars will tell you, if you ask a question, if you ask a question, you know, there was something that comes out of that. You know, what to do, what not to do. You differentiate between what is lawful, what is unlawful. And your iman will increase after that. It's a simple methodology. So, Sheikh Wajjik Neem, may Allah protect him. He says, a man came to me, it's an Arabic joke, so I'm, you, know, you know, maybe some of you will get it, some of you may not. So he says, a, a, a guy came to me and he says, uh, the, is shaitan, does the devil have a surah, like a, 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 <laughs> a belly button, like does he have a navel? La allu habibi sukari. Sukari is like a type of another orange. You know, how do you answer a question like that, man? So to differentiate between is a beneficial knowledge, what's not a beneficial knowledge is that which will make you do something. يَتَرَتَّبُ عَلَيْهِ amal. So it's in the question what you're asking. So we will know what kind of people we're dealing with with the question they ask.
So whether it's a long journey or long uh, uh, conference or whatever it is, how to differentiate between knowledge and beneficial or not beneficial is your behavior after you learn. That's why I asked for a change. Remember that. Uh, look, I'll give you a simple example. The, the, even the knowledge that Allah bestowed upon us in the Quran, even our ibadah, our ibadah actually tells you to become a better human being. Understand? It's a long concept, but I'm going to give you a quick one. Inna salata your salah words off evil. Take your wealth, the mean the zakah, to purify them from the illness of greed. Be, be generous. So that's your, to, your salah words off evil. Your akhlaq. Your zakah becomes generous. Akhlaq, character. Fasting will teach you taqwa, piety. So the act of worship will teach you a character. A good human being. Hajj, right? Remember Hajj? Okay. Al Hajj Ajmal Hajj. No quarreling, no beginning of even intimate relationship, and not all of that stuff. So you're controlling your inside and outside. In Hajj, if you've been to Hajj, you know that this is the most difficult part, right? So I'm trying to tell you that even God Almighty is trying to tell you that your ibadah, your acts of worship is supposed to change your character. So your beneficial, not beneficial, will reflect upon your character. Yes? So I'm going to ask you to, please, if it is to be, it's up to me. Change. That's the only thing I ask people when I talk, Wallahi. When you come out, these doors cannot be the same as you came in. Change. So I have one request. Forgive me, could I have one? Can I have one request, brothers and sisters? Can I ask everybody to stand up, please? This is, this is my, my dear. I know. I, I do this because, wallahi, it's very close to my heart. Can I ask you to turn around, see the person next to you, and give him a hug? Give him a hug, man. Give him a hug. Till I love you for the sake of Allah. I know it's not going to be easy to hold on, Layla, but you know, I love you for the sake of Allah. Yes, please. Allahu Akbar. This is how the spirit is supposed to be. How are we going to be united and change one word at a time, one heart and mind at a time? That's how you change by your akhlaq, and that's how you be beneficial or not beneficial, Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khairan for that. Without further ado, inshallah, we'd like to close off tonight's event, inshallah, with a closing dua by Sheikh Ala, inshallah. Okay. okay, so we'll make the dua, inshallah. We'll talk about hugging? Hugging? Sure. Okay. Oh, the police officer we're hugging too? Oh, I love you guys. That is very nice. Give him a hand, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for helping us. Appreciate your presence. See, it works. Love is contagious. A smile is contagious. Try it. Inshallah. So we'll make a final dua, inshallah. We'll ask Allah SWT to accept from all of us, Ya Rabbi Ameen. يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الأولين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا واصلح ذات بيننا واهدنا واهد بنا واجعلنا سببا لمن اهتدى يمن كتابنا يسر حسابنا بيض وجوهنا اختم بالباقيات الصالحات أعمالنا كلنا ولا تكن علينا أكرمنا ولا تهنا زدنا ولا تنقصنا احفظنا ولا تضيعنا انصرنا وانصر بنا ولا تنصر علينا آثرنا وآثر بنا ولا تؤثر علينا امكر لنا ولا تمكر بنا يا سامع الصوت يا سابق الفوت يا كاسي العظام لحما بعد الموت هون علينا سكرات الموت يا عالم السر والعلن 
استر عيوبنا في السر والعلن وارحم غربتنا باللحد والكفن وارحمنا إذا ما صارت أموالنا لغيرنا بلا ثمن وارحمنا إذا ما تركنا المال والأهل والسكن ارحمنا يوم العرض وتحت الأرض وفوق الأرض ارحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبيك وحبيبك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين Pies person's destiny. Inshallah, 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 inshallah.